Good morning, good morning. This is the good attorney, Clint Paris. And guess what? If you hear my voice, it's a good day for you, too. We are live in studio here in Tech News Radio, reality radio, where everybody's a star, and you are listening to Straight Up the Middle. And you all know those who join us every week, and maybe if you don't join every week, I do the best I can, really, to take this thing straight up the left side of the political spectrum. Because guess what? There's nobody here on the right to make me move to the middle. So <laughs> I'm going to keep staying true to my core values. And we're going to talk about some politics and stuff today. But guess what? I got a couple other things on my mind this morning. First of all, I want to welcome to the studio none other than Esteban, our new engineer. He's behind the tables making sure things go the way that they should. So I want to welcome you to the studio. So listen, y'all, if you call in, don't be rough on him, all right? He's new and fresh. I'm about to scare him out of here because we need our engineers. So I want to welcome Esteban to the, uh, to the show and helping us out this morning. But I got a couple things on my mind I want to talk about that are not political, that really just kind of sprung into my mind, which says to me, God's working today. And one of them was about Father's Day, because I just, I just think that in America, we have a number of things that we often focus on that are not right. And one of the things that are right are some of the things that our fathers are doing, because you cannot have a stable society unless you have stable communities. You can't st have stable communities unless you have stable neighborhoods. You can't have stable neighborhoods without stable households. And I don't care how much my ladies out there making, how much you're doing, how well you're rocking the world. You cannot have a stable and balanced household unless you have a man who is standing in his proper place. And that does not resign itself to just how much money he's making, but it resigns itself to the leadership, to the guidance, to the, the things that he's doing to make sure that the people in that household are safe, that they are well prepared, that they are taken care of. And I just want to encourage everybody, if you have a man in your life, uh, 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 a father, a brother, anyone who fits that role, make sure on this Father's Day you give him an attaboy. Because the truth be told, we men take a lot of hits. You know, everywhere you go, we take a lot of hits. And I'm just, just so proud of all the men in this community that I know who have stood in the gap and made sure that their households were taken care of and as a result, our communities are stronger for what they were. So, so I just want to give that shout-out to on Father's Day, and we're going to come back a little bit later and talk a little bit more about that. I also want to talk a little bit about Juneteenth. It's just, a, it's just an interesting thing to me about Juneteenth. And here's my first disclosure and my challenge to uh, the Hillsborough County school system. I don't know what y'all are doing now, but I went through Hillsborough County Public Schools. I like saying that. I am a public school product, but I learned nothing, nothing, about Juneteenth. Zero. I can talk about a lot of other things. I can talk about the Holocaust. I learned about that in school. I can talk about the Pilgrims. I learned about that in school. I, taught, I learned about Christmas addicts, the first person to die in the American Revolution. Black man. I learned that. I learned so many things about our history, but I did not learn about Juneteenth. And it has always pissed me off that I didn't. So I was a grown man in my 20s, and my wife, come, my, 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 my fiance at the time, comes to me and says, there's this event to celebrate Juneteenth. It's going to be a fashion show. And these, this couple I know called the Johnsons are putting on the first Juneteenth event in the city of Tampa. It's back in the 90s there. Remember that? Going back a ways. And I was like, Juneteenth, what are you talking about? So I went and did some research, and I really was just irritated. All the educators who I felt had failed me, black, white, and otherwise, that this particular event. Now, I've been taught a lot of things about black empowerment and things of that nature, but it's nothing like understanding the, the significance of the day that your people got their freedom in this country. And Juneteenth is that day. Now, some of y'all out there saying, well, what are you talking about? Exactly. So now we have the Internet. You can do a little research. But let me see if I can do it the best I can say it is. It was June 19th in 1965. That, that, that uh, I think it's 1865. 1865, that I think General Gordon Granger lands in Galveston. And he is surprised to see black people are still walking around like slaves. And he says, like Richard Pryor did once, listen, y'all y'all are free. You still got to pick the cotton, but you ain't got to sing them songs while you're doing it. Y'all are free. You no longer are, are slaves. So it wasn't until 1865 in Galveston, Texas, that the actual final pronouncement of the Emancipation Proclamation uh, was read in, into law in Texas, the last place that people were held in enslavement officially in America. We can talk about whether we've still been enslaved since then. We'll come back to that. Now, here's why I say this. It pissed me off so much. I took my kids to find out where was this thing actually written, 
And where was it first read? So I'm going to give everybody a little research assignment. You go out and do this for yourself. I want you to go up to Hampton University. It was called Hamp Camp, Camp Hamp Hampton at the time. And there's a tree there. It is called the Emancipation Tree. Because right after Abraham Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation, some guy got on a horse, because they were in horse and buggy back then, and he rode from D.C. to Camp Hampton, Virginia, where tons of escaped slaves were camped at. And under this tree that's still alive today, the tree really is standing there, and they got all kind of props and things holding it up, but the same tree is still standing there, and that's where they read the Emancipation Proclamation for the first time. And that tree is still standing at Hampton University right now. Just a great. So we went out there and visited that tree. And then we went our bus all the way to Galveston. We went all the way to Galveston, Texas. I took the kids, the wife, and if the dog could have rode that far, I would have took him too. We went out to Galveston, Texas, because I wanted them to connect those two points of history and not let them make it into what it will be for them without my, my interpretation. But I wanted to anchor. I was just so irritated that I had not been involved about that. But I wanted to get that off my chest this morning. I know we talk politics. I know. I know my regular callers. I know callers in this truck right Hold that truck in the lane, Carl. I know you're <laughs> upset right now. But we're going to get to some politics in a minute. But before we do that, you know I can't do this show by myself. Even when the professor is not here, we try to bring you some of the most enlightened minds we have in Tampa. And listen, everybody, I am so excited this morning. I've got nobody here with me this morning, the lovely Monica Williams-Harris. Good morning, Monica. Good morning, How you doing this morning? Clint. I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. As you can see, I'm on fire this morning. I, I, I feel it's it and I hear I, it. That's I, I'm good. I'm on fire. I'm more so than normal. Listen, you got me fired up last week and you, you got a little snazzy. Well, you know, I know Keith deal with this, but I don't deal with the regular. <laughs> like, you got my number. <laughs> You know, so I did with any you yeah, right. You, you, I'm gonna you, use the you, number. You did. You called. Thank me. you so much for agreeing to come in and uh, participate on the show. Um, and just for y'all who don't know a little bit about Monica, Monica comes from from West Palm Beach. Yes. Uh, went to Florida a University, graduated of Florida Law School, federal clerk here in Tampa, and then she decided to make Tampa her home. And she has been such an impact on our community. I'm just so happy to have you with us this morning. So good morning, Monica. Good How you morning. doing? I'm doing I'm doing very, very well. I appreciate I'm blessed to be here. Very thankful for you reaching out. I've I've kind of watched um some of the shows and so i I feel like I'm in good company because some okay. of the Ed, representative Ed and Rain was here last <laughs> week. So oh, yeah. I'm on the blessed mic. Well, so you know, I hope you, I can you, I can hey, live listen, up to what I, he I did. know you can I, I know you can because I remember I I I, I still owe you an apology. We had a major event here in the city of Tampa, and I needed somebody to cover that. I said, Monica, can you go to this event? And it didn't turn into a melee, but as the vice president of George Edge Bar Association, you did a wonderful job Boy. representing our community and helped this whole community through a very difficult time. Yeah, thank you know, you. that kept our, us, us on track. So I want to thank you for that. But but I mentioned Father's Day because I know I, I I had the benefit of getting to know uh, your father, uh, uh, Gerald, Gerald Williams. One that had such a cool walk. Yes. You know, I mean, if anybody have, you know, you, so no, some of you may know who Jay, he, he didn't walk like straight toward, he had kind of like an angle <laughs> when he came walking, he kind of walked to this, you know, he kind of, kind of a lean, a oh, lean walk. A good, it was a, it was a, hard, a good 70s, you know, str <laughs> what, what, a strut. A good strut. Yeah, yeah you know, yeah. some of the ladies, y'all see Denzel walking, man, look at Denzel. But listen, back in the 70s, all the brothers had to have a walk. Yeah, you know you had you know you had a walk. Everybody had and you walked a little, give a little space, so you because you had to move your body parts as you walk. But but tell me a little bit about what you're reflecting on as you think back on Father's Day as it, it comes comes to us. So I think you know Father's Day after my father passed in 20, uh, 2010. So Father's Day going forward has always been a little bit challenging. Once I got uh, remarried and uh, my my husband has I have three bonus daughters, so I began celebrating my husband and celebrating my brother who has three children. Um, but just kind of what you were talking about in terms of um, my father was my mom was the rock. But in terms of just a protector and kind of um, taking on that biblical role of what a father right. is supposed to be. Yeah. There was never a moment in my sister, my, my brother or my lives where we did not know that if, you know, if the rubber hit the road that our father would not be present and right. would not be there. Now, he's one of those people, I'm, you know, I'll give you a little space, particularly when you got older, give you a little space to kind of spread your wing, uh -huh. but I'm going to be there when you when right. you fall, at least to kind of help guide you back. Right. Um, and so I am appreciative of the men in my life, yourself, who I see a lot of my father in, in terms of the way you engage and interact with your children. 
um, Daryl in terms of the way he interacts and guides his children. Mr. Stewart, my husband, yes. um, Keith Harris, um, Mr. Mr. Stewart. So um, being a father is a difficult job, and I don't think yes. you all get enough praise for the roles that you all play mm -hmm. um, in the family because, you know, being a mom is tough because we, you know, we are the caregivers. If something happens, the children are going to come to us. But fathers really are the backbone to the family, and y'all are kind of like the spine. If the family is a if the family is a body, the father tends to be the spine. I like that. I and like And you can't that. move. The yes. family can't move and right. function the way it should be. Um, and, and so, you know, and 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 fatherhood can you don't have to just be a father in the house. You can be a father figure. Yes. Um, yes. But I think yes. for children to kind of. Um, for our community to push forward, men need to be present. You don't necessarily need to be a, a, a father, but being a father figure, yes, um, I uh, think is extremely important. Wow. So my father, you know, I'm biased. I think my daddy was probably one of the best daddies oh, was that sharp. was out there. He was he was a tough, look, look, tough you know, man. And, and really, you know, I, I, I and I commend him and a lot of other men for making space for younger men to be in their presence and to learn from them. Yeah. And I was blessed to have the chance to to spend some time. I told you, kind of, we were talking on the phone a yeah. little bit. You know, I have an affinity for older men. Mm -hmm. You know, you know, don't don't need to stop it, y'all. Before anybody starts trying to write an email, Clint likes men. Stop that. And not in that way. But but we need to be able to connect with other men and hold them in a certain level of esteem so that we can try to find and pull out of ourselves yeah. those values and those strengths. And it's a continuum. And one of know. the and one of the things I will say that I do did admire about my father. He was he was a man's man. Um, but he also was not afraid to show his vulnerability. Yes. Um, which I think is extremely important. And oftentimes black men in the space and in the environment that we're in, from a cultural perspective, that's just not something that you see black men doing. We're not allowed to. We're not allowed to You're because it's really seen as a to. form of weakness. But I, yeah. one of the things I think, and, and perhaps because my dad worked for himself, so there was a little bit more flexibility he had. But my father was never afraid to speak truth to power, which is yeah. where I get it from, which is where my yes. sister gets it from, which is where my brother gets it from. Um, yes, I will say the Williams uh, will speak up. Goodness gracious. So, so, so I appreciated the uh -huh. fact that in addition to him being a strong rock of yes. a man and a man's man, he wasn't afraid to show his vulnerable side. He wasn't afraid to share that he was afraid or that he was sad or that he was angry or whatever the emotion was. He also allowed his daughters... Um, his two daughters, who are very strong-willed um, young women, to uh -huh. be the best of themselves unapologetically. Got it. Okay. Um, and so I think that's important. Well, so. outstanding. I I uh, really enjoyed, like I said, getting to know him. Love those comments. Hey, listen, everybody. We're gonna pay a few bills. We're gonna take a quick break. And when we come back, we're gonna jump into some politics. We're gonna talk about some stuff that's going on with Monica. Uh, she's one of the most dynamic young young leaders in our community. Uh, an attorney, an author, a mother, you name it. She, and listen, everybody, she can sing a heck of a song if you need her to. So anyway, <laughs> we're going to be right back in a few minutes with In Touch News Radio, Reality Radio, where everybody's a star. We'll be right back. Hey, this is Agent Wright, better known as Mr. Clean. You looking for some great barbecues? Come see them two brothers in the grill, located at 423 Virginia Street, Charleston, West Virginia. We got ribs, chicken, pulled pork, brisket, collard greens, mac and cheese, baby. Come get some. And get you a nice, smooth cigar. 304-550-4431. That is 304-550-4431. Come get some, baby. The rib man, mama, the rib man. My name is Gil Sampson. I didn't come from a very rich family, and so paying for college would have been very tough. I don't know if I would have been able to go to the college that I went to, and then I don't know if I would have gotten into the career that I am in. So I think Bright Futures has done a lot to shape my life. I uh, got a job as a structural engineer, and I design residential buildings, commercial buildings all over the United States. Because of Bright Futures, I was able to go to college you know, so many kids just don't even ever get that opportunity. And to be able to do it and not have any debt when I graduated is amazing. And it was all thanks to Bright Futures. Florida has created more than one million jobs in only five years. And a great education connects our students to these exciting opportunities. That's why the Florida Lottery has funded Bright Futures scholarships to help over 725,000 students attend college. Because every play is for education. The Florida Lottery. Just imagine. Finger, man. I'm supposed to get a live finger. It go live. It, 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 but that, 
the finger? Yeah, that's all right, man. Hey, listen, everybody. We are back live here at Intex News Radio. Reality Radio, everybody's a star. You can hear my voice. You're listening to Straight Up the Middle. No, we have not forgotten. We're a political show. We're going to get to that. But there were a couple things on my mind this morning. I just felt like... I needed to exhale a little bit, you know. Uh, uh, my, my wife Samantha and her, my daughter Samaya up in Atlanta for a fashion, uh, uh, a buying show with with uh, Melissa Melvin from uh, 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 Melvet, her uh, her her boutique that she, pop up boutique that she runs. And so I've been kind of running wild and loose for the last couple of days. They're coming back today, so I'm going to be safe after that. But I want to <laughs> get a couple of things off my chest. I'm just so happy though. I've got Monica Williams Harris here in studio. Attorney Monica Williams here. Uh, who was here with us, and uh, she brought with us some, some uh, a nice surprise. Monica, you have written a book. Tell I wrote me about a book. That. Right. And if you're watching on Facebook, you can see the book here. It's it's a good book. So what inspired the book's called God's Promise. Yeah. God's Promise. So Tell my, us about it. So my husband and I, three and a half years ago, adopted our son. Okay. Um, and one of the things that we did not want was for his, the way our family was formed to be, something that we would hide. We wanted the word adoption to be kind of in our regular vocabulary so it would not be something that he felt was a stigma. I think sometimes um, in our community, for some reason, adoption is not really talked about um, or it's not something that we openly talk about. African-American families have adopted uh, family members forever. Not yes. Maybe not formal, but we've adopted. Somebody's had a baby, couldn't take care of them, we bring them in. So we've done it forever. Yes. Um, but we wanted, I wanted to, and we wanted to ensure that that term was not something that was um, a foreign to him. Okay. And so there are lots of books out there that kind of explain uh, the, for, the concept of adoption in an age appropriate way. There are white families with diverse children, there are right. animals, white families with black children, white families with white children. Yes. But there was no book with a black family with a black child. Really? In particular, a black boy. Wow. And when you look at the lack of, there's a lack of diversity. I mean, no one really talks about this, but in a children's book space, there's a lack of diversity in terms of the main character of a book being a black child, a black family, particularly black boys. I think it's like 7% if you look at the range okay. of Okay. So it's pretty low. So God put it on my spirit. I wanted to be able to share the book with him or ex explain to him how we how our family was created in a way that he would understand. And God led me to write uh, God's Promise. Wow! Now is so this book the target audience it was uh, is it the parents? The it's children? Really, it's it's both. It's a, it's okay. an oper it's a way for adoptive parents to introduce the concept of ado so adoption is not identified anywhere in this book. The word adoption is not in here. Okay. But the concept of adoption yes. is discussed, and right. so it's just an opening for families who are adoptive families to in the, at least initiate the conversation with their children in an age-appropriate right. manner. Because everybody's story is different. Our story is different than... I have a couple of friends who have adopted. Their stories are different in terms of how their families were created. But I wanted to, I wanted to be able to introduce the concept and assist parents because... Of the many things that challenges that you have when you're an adoptive family, the biggest challenge, and I think any adoptive family will tell you this, the biggest challenge is how do you tell your child okay. that they're adopted? Right. You never want them to find out because there's a whole lot of studies and books about how children respond, particularly young children, respond when they find out that you're not the mother that carried you, carried them in the Correct. room. Yes. Um, so you want to be able to do it in a way that's um, age appropriate, that's sensitive. Um, and like I said, everybody's story is different. So God's Promise is the first book of a series. The main okay. pr main character is Isaac, and he's five years old. So we've read it to our son three or four times, and he wow. loves it. So. so 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 now are you so you're writing a subsequent book. Correct. It's now, already written. So we got t that's two. That's two. So have you thought about doing a prequel though? I so have the book before the first before book. Before the first book, that explains why y'all did right. So <laughs> that book is a little more. Per I've started it, yes, but that yeah. book is a little more personal, and wow. so it's harder to write um, because I have to kind of dig deeper into my into some deep places for me. Yes, um, it's therapeutic, but it's difficult. And right. when you put it out there, it's out there. I'm yeah. cool to share <laughs> bits and pieces of the story, wow, but that, to kind of put it out there. But yeah, you know, so. you've always demonstrated an immense sense of, of, of courage and bravery and all the things that you do. Uh, so I'm not surprised that you're willing to 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 do something of this nature. The book, and one of the things that that jumped out, the the word that came to my my mind was, in in life, all kinds of things happen. Mm -hmm. The question is whether or not you're willing to own those things. Correct. And if you own them, you get to define how other people then interpret those things. And I think this uh, uh, book, 
allows adoptive parents with Correct. their child Correct. to own it. Correct. You know, and, so. and there's and there's nothing there's nothing we've there's nothing wrong with children who have people who have adopted. There's nothing wrong with children who were adopted. So that let's start there. And I think that's one of the messages that we have to in, enforce and in, 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 impart on these on our children who are brought in. Because my at the end of the day, our son is our son. Yes. Um, and there's you can't tell us any different. He acts just like his father. If you look at baby pictures of me, he probably looks a little bit like <laughs> me. Um, but we didn't want that there be, to be a stigma associated with that word, and we did not want him to feel any different than his nephew, his cousins, um, uh -huh. or anybody else in our family who was biologically born. Um, he is our child at the end of the day, and, and it, it, we want yes. him to feel that way. So the book is available on Amazon. Um, I'm excited about it. This is a, this was a God I, I have learned through this process um, to be obedient. So this is just a, another example of just being obedient. Wow. Um, now, okay, so for, for the, the techies, they may, oh, Amazon's all good and all. But if they want to come out, somebody want to come shake your hand, say, hey, you know, I, I, this, I'm just moved by this. Uh, I want to get an autographed copy, things of that nature, something, events and things. That, where, where, where could somebody meet up with you maybe and actually get a copy of that book? So I'm it? happy that you asked. So <laughs> um, today today at 2 and 3.30, okay. um, where I'm having a cookies and conversation. It's a book talk and a book signing um, while I go into more detail about my husband and I's journey, um, two miles, um, and me write, the journey to writing this book okay. at the Portico, which okay. is downtown. Um, Tampa. So at two o'clock, the two o'clock one, it's free. The okay. two o'clock one, the last time I checked, Eventbrite is at capacity. Okay. Um, but the three thirty one, there's still some space. So if you want to come down, I'd love to meet anybody. You know, really? people that want to have a conversation. I'm excited about the book. And when God gives you something and you're obedient to what He's telling you to do, I just told God at the beginning of the year, just make me available. Wow. And so oh, that, wherever that he is, wherever oh. he leads me is where I'm going. So this is, I'm, I'm extremely excited about that. Say, well, I'm glad to hear that the book, that event is, uh, you know, you're having that event. I mean, I, it'd be great for people. Uh, if you listen to my voice, you want to take and see what Monica looks like and to get a glimpse of the book, we've got it here held up on our Facebook, our Intex News our Facebook page. You can take a look at that. Just really, I, I mean, and, and, and this really portends why, I, I was excited to have you come into the show. I mean, you've always had, you know, so many opinions. We're going to put these things out there for people to see. And I sent you a list of some things I want to talk did. about. You made me gonna, do some research. Right, I, so, I looked, I said, oh, gosh. Just a little bit. We won't go too deep into it. But if you're listening to the show and you want to call in, we're going to talk about a few things. The call-in number is 813-444-9588. 9588 So I want to talk about a couple things that um, we have coming up. So we've got coming up the Democratic debates. Right. And they've split the, first of all, what are your thoughts about this idea of qualifying? Somebody is uh, um, <clears throat> a candidate having to qualify to then participate in the debates. I'm not, a, I understand the why of it, um, but I don't ne think I necessarily agree with the process. I think if there are okay. 23 people who right, correct. have made a decision that they want to run for the highest office in the country. Correct. Um, I think that all of them should be given an opportunity to at least showcase to the American public uh -huh. why they potentially could be, you know, the candidate for them. Okay. Um, I think limiting it, limiting it based on some, what I frankly think is some probably subjective criteria. I okay. mean, on those polling numbers, but um, I think limiting it to that is problematic. Like, for instance, Wayne Messam, who's the mayor of Miramar, Correct. Um, who I don't know personally, but we were in Tallahassee at the same time. Okay. I don't know what his policy... Um, positions. I mean, I can okay. read and kind of figure it out, but I've never, I've met him a long time ago in college. Right. Um, in passing, but I would like to know what kind of, you know, wh what what his policy positions are. You know, where is he aligned on certain things? I'd like to hear from him because some we tend to be feelers when we vote, and so there may be someone, something that he says that I align with. It's like, oh, okay, I like that. Right. Um, and so I think by not allowing all 23 candidates now, is it 23? Because I don't know right. if we missed something. <laughs> somebody um, may announce this right, morning. Somebody may announce this morning. Right. Uh, by not allowing all 23 candidates to participate in the debate, I think does a disservice to the process, in my opinion. Okay. So I think some of that came out of the idea of last year they had the two debate stages, right. they wanted the A and B, and some people complained about it and they were trying to. And, and I don't think in the in historically we've had this many people, uh, you know, declare themselves for president right. before now. So we have to. It also pretends the impact of mass media yeah. on who gets 
to get their message out and who does not. Right. And is that, do you think that this reflects that role being too significant? Because I thought in this day of social media, and other, there were so many ways to get around mass media. Mm -hmm. But the focus for the last month has been on getting on the debate stage. Right. Then those debate stages on primetime TV. Uh, and it seems like that's been the focus. Get on that stage, which reminds me then that mass media may still be the most powerful vehicle for getting your message out. I mean, it is. I mean, social, me say, social media is important as well. And I okay. think you have to kind of have, I mean, particularly with the millennials. Okay. Um, social media is kind of, they, they're not picking up a newspaper and kind of reading <laughs> what the, ten, you know, the, the right. local papers are, are right. saying about, you know, whatever's going on. They're, they are kind of instantaneous, in, instant gratification. I need to know what, I need to kind of get in, get out. Um, and so I think social media plays a, plays a role in that. Um, but we saw in 2016 that the poll polls mean nothing. I mean, I've right. never been called yeah. on a poll. No, me, me either. Ever. Me either. Me either. But, you know, I, a lot of people, Beyonce's never called me either, but I don't hold that against her. <laughs> you know, that means she's a bad person. But, but, gotta, it, you know. but, but my point is, if you're using these polls as a means to determine who gets to sit on that debate stage, which is my understanding in terms of the, yes. one of the things that they're right. using... I've never been polled. And so okay. if there are, I don't know who you're question, talking to, I don't know who you're polling, but mm -hmm. if... I think I'm a regular person. If a regular person is not being polled now, admitted they could be potentially <laughs> polling me when my phone rings at home, the landline rings. Uh -huh, if it's not an emergency, right. I may not be answering it. Okay. But if it's if there if the if one of the criteria is kind of where you stand in the in these various polls, right? I haven't been polled, and so okay. there are people that probably could be Messam supporters or other supporters that are not on that debate stage that haven't been called, so that you know, so their numbers aren't moving. So the so. first the first thing is if the polls are flawed, then the debates. You know, process then potentially is, right, and the last election demonstrated us y'all don't y'all know what y'all doing, <laughs> uh, or who y'all are polling. Right, right, exactly. And you then some people could lie on the poll. Like if you call me, you're a pollster. There's no, there's no, um, there, there's nothing to indicate whether or not the person that you're questioning is telling the truth. So if you call right. me and I want to skew a poll, and you say, "Were well, you a, and you know, are you supporting 45? Oh yeah, I love his policies. No fool. Well, when I get in that booth, I'm not going to support him. Or right. com or conversely, conversely. right? Yes, <clears throat> right, exactly. And, and I would like to think so. I hopefully you know the, the that system works out. Um, I I was thinking this though, depending on which which the people going day two have an advantage. Yes. Because you get to now analyze how day one Correct. goes. And if my understanding is you got Elizabeth Warren, she's going day one. Yeah. You've got Biden, Sanders, and Harris. Yeah, the heavy hitters. Well, I shouldn't on. say heavy hitters, but you, I think Warren and Booker and some other people go on the first day. And Biden, um, Sanders, Harris, Gillibrand, I think. Gillibrand, yes. Gillibrand, yeah, so. And so they're already saying that um, Warren is going to be the star of day one. She's going to be in the center of the stage. So mm -hmm. it kind of, for her... This is going to be a, a big boost. Yes, it's a make and, or break it. And 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 her numbers have been trending up lately. Yeah. You know, I was, you know, they were saying, you know, kind of dismissive, you know, Donald Trump with his Pocahontas slur and mm -hmm. all that that kind of stuff. But she now is really really neck and neck with Sanders. Yeah. And and you know your thoughts about that? I mean, I think I to be perfectly honest, I'm you kind of staying um 500 feet away from... Uh -uh, no, <laughs> no, no. And that's why we got you in front of that microphone. So we're going to take a quick break. going to pay a few bills. When I come back, I'm going to get you right okay. back. We're going to bring you a lot closer. Now you're going to get to stand back on this one. It's, it's on the record today. You're live on Intention News Radio, Reality Radio. Everybody, so we're going to take a quick break. Come back. We're going to talk about, is Elizabeth Warren making a move? We'll be right back. All right, let me get that. Okay. Yeah, I think he's gonna, yeah. he has he has some challenges. There is actually a really good document. Hi, this is Dale Day. Join me every Monday at 7 p.m. for Jazz at Miss Connie's House, bringing you the smoothest jazz and the coolest guests right here on In Touch Radio. Hey, this is Miss K with K's Kitchen, where we're cooking Chicago-style fried chicken and fish with the authentic Chicago-style mouth sauce. Come check us out at our new restaurant located at 3320 East Osborne Avenue in the Jackson Heights area. We have a brand new menu which includes whole wings, catfish, pizza puffs, and much more. 
Call us at 813-368-5196. Again, that number is 813-368-5196. See you soon. Been in a car crash? Call Ricky. Reality Radio, everybody start. Listen out there, listen. We are breaking in a brand new board operator. This guy, he is so happy he's not behind the microphone <laughs> or on video. <laughs> Esteban is running the board for us. Good morning, Esteban. We're glad you're here with us. Listen, man, we're going to take it easy on you, man. We really take it easy. We're going we gonna to get you right where we need you to be. So so if you're out there listening, uh, you know, don't don't get it, get upset with Esteban. And also, I, I'm so excited. I've got Monica Williams Harris in studio with me. She has added another credential to her list of all the other things that she has done. I'm going to take a sidebar, though, and go take a side. So, so I was doing looking you up. Tell me about this Moni J alter ego. What, ah! Tell me about Moni J. You put what it the? out there now, <laughs> so now it's not an alter ego. And listen, I looked it up. I'm like, Moni J. Man, let me take this Moni J so, out. So my family calls me Moni, and okay. sometimes my brother calls me Moni J. So my okay. middle initial before I got married was Jarrell. Okay. So it was, it's a way for me to kind of be free on social media. Uh-huh. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm very, I'm pretty selective about who I invite as friends. Right. Because, you know, you can't, people yeah. screen, no, screen, no, your I, screenshot I is not your friend. Yes, yes. Um, but it allows me, I think, to be able to be pretty, I'm pretty open and honest anyway, but to be a little bit more open and honest on my social media relative to things political. Yes. You can't talk politics. I mean, we're in a very conservative um, profession. Yes. To be, you know, yes, frank. Yes. I mean, it's getting to, you know, it's kind of leaning more, uh-huh. kind of going more center. Yeah. But by and large, it's a pretty conservative it is. profession. It is. And so um, you don't talk about politics right. t- typically in an office where no, you may no, be the only no, one. No, you do not. Um, and so the Moni J provided me, provides, I think, an opportunity for me to, uh, to, to be more open and honest about some of my positions politically. Okay. Yeah, I've, I've always, I see that pop up every now and again. And you, you, you hit it sometime right you out know, the park. I, the I, I try to be, I, <laughs> listen, I said at the very beginning, Gerald, Gerald and Carolyn Williams, that's my mama who's from Memphis, by the way. My mama's oh, really? a Memphis, okay. Memphis, Memphis girl. So they, um, they taught all three of us to speak truth to power. Yes. Um, and so mm-hmm. I try my very best to, to do that on a regular and consistent basis. Sometimes I probably speak more truth than my mama likes, but. <laughs> I don't think you'd ever do that. Do that. And, and I've tried to, like, as a parent, um, appreciate that. I, I I think the 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 one of the things that that terrifies me about my children, if if ever they wanted and felt they needed to say something, and they didn't think they could. Yeah, and and yeah. I one of the things, and I try to tell, encourage young women and just young people in general, particularly as millennials. And I don't necessarily think there's too much of a uh, pause on them because they pretty t- are pretty free to speak their mind. Mm-hmm. But encouraging youth to speak. Yes. You know, if you have a problem, there's nothing wrong. There, you know, you have the Constitution is there for a reason. Yes, there's a freedom of speech in right, the Constitution right, for right. a reason. That's an un, that's not an unfettered right, but you have a right if you don't think something is appropriate to speak up and speak out. When and when and where to speak out, yeah. and in the, the manner in which to speak out can use some finessing. But in terms of telling somebody, tell, somebody telling you and encouraging you not to use your voice, I have a fundamental problem with that. Because I think that the, the value is knowing and, and understanding what people feel and think. We need more of that, yes. not less of that. And only by having people express themselves can we really get down into the kind of ways that we can solve some of their problems. And I know politics backs its way yeah. into this. And that's one of my biggest issues with a lot of politicians is, is getting them in a space where they can actually talk. Right. They can actually and express, be free and express yes, themselves. Yes, as opposed to campaigning for the next election Correct. or the next contribution. And, and uh, so one of the things, I think we talked about Elizabeth Warren before we went to the break. I think that's one of her advantages is that she appears to be pretty fiery and is not um, afraid to speak her mind and 
take 45 to task. You know, she's got an interesting little slogan that she's come up with. I don't know what And it's it funny. Is. It says, I've got a solution for that. Yes. And I thought that's brilliant. But but if you li- listen to what she's saying, she's, she the, all, she's, she's, the, only co- she's the only candidate, generally speaking, that has details about mm. in some of her policy positions. Right. She generally is the one of the only ones that really has some details about how you can yeah. speak. I want to cure global warning, uh, warming. Yeah. How? Right. How are you gonna How are you gonna impact uh, uh, climate change? Right. Criminal justice reform. How? Yes. So my question for politicians is always, how are you going to do this? But right. that may be the lawyer in me, but I think all people who all voters should ask the how. I thought it was just brilliant. The, the, the sl- I got yeah, an answer. For I have that. an answer for that. And and, and because Good. one of the issues, of course, we we think about with politicians when you get in office, what are you gonna do? Right. When you get there, well, you know, you know, I don't want to jump over Elizabeth Warren and talk about Donald Trump just yet, but. He is absolutely doing what he said he was going to do. He's uncouth, he's wrecking mm-hmm. havoc, and he's helping the biz, big, big businesses make more money. Yep. And nobody should be surprised because he kind of projected that um, before he got into office. He did. And I was surprised that that messaging from him took root. I, I, I didn't think that. I didn't think that the masses, the 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 day, the, the 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 laborer, the, the the construction worker, the factory worker would respond to that kind of messaging. Which one? The, the about Donald Trump. The 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 I'm gonna you know make more money, drop taxes. I, I was just surprised at that. Well, I really was. I I was not, and I'm gonna be real on okay. on on the In Touch News Radio on on, on this show. If you, you do it any other kind of way, we'll call you. We're gonna call you out. <laughs> Um, what do, what Donald Trump was effective in doing was feeding into the guttural instincts of the majority of people in this country, and that is racism and misogyny. And yeah. if you make yourself, if you make other people believe that they are being victimized. So what he did effectively was he made white men, particularly white rich men, okay. Feel like they were being victimized. And then those folks told poor white people, poor white men in particular, that they were being victimized. And they've been because, waiting for that. Right, because the Muslims, the 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 um the, the Hispanic, the immigrants were taking your jobs, the black folks are gonna come in and rob and kill you and steal and rape your wife, whatever it was that was feeding into this this guttural, um, racist feeling that people have they don't talk about. Right. Um is what he fed into. Gave them red meat and they jumped all over it. So once he got elected, it did not surprise me that you have an uptick in hate crimes. It didn't surprise me that you have an uptick. In, it didn't surprise me that, you're, that you see this push um, um, of you know men, you know this pa- patriarchal society trying to take control of women's ability to do what they want to do with their body. None of this that he's doing surprises me at all. What is unfortunate is that you have people who are in Congress who are supposed to be, based on their constitutional requirements, supposed to be taking him to task and keeping him in line and you have people on the other side of the aisle that are silent yes. and they're not doing their job. And as a yes, result, right. this is a party who prides itself in conserving, and I think Ed may have, you or Ed may have said this last week, right. conserving the Constitution what the four fo- uh, founding fathers believe when they put together these documents that that's what the Republican Party is supposed to stand for, but they are turning a blind eye to an admin- to a person in an administration who is doing everything in his power to unravel everything that this country is supposed to stand for. And you know, for. I think of that word conservative, it means status quo. We want to yes, keep things keep like every- they yeah. were. And then they do something crazy like want to go back to the way things were. Right. Which is even worse because there's not nothing worse and there's no place ever. No. Ever do you want to think about or embrace going backwards? No, at all. At no point in time, you always want to think for the future, plan, grow, improve. Anytime you go, it's, it's just a way of losing proposition. And that's why I'm kind of thinking, trying to, as we as we look at this election um, coming out, the, the 2020 election, um, the issue is what are going to be the top, the hot topics? And I want you to think about that. Yeah. Cause we got a caller on the line here that that's called this morning. Good morning, caller. You're on live with Intex News Radio, Reality Radio, with everybody the star. This is the good attorney, attorney Clint Paris. I've got co-hosting with me, Monica Williams, caller. Good morning, and what's on your mind? Good morning, good morning, good attorney. This is Carl calling in. Uh, you know, uh, um, the. Uh, and you were talking about Elizabeth Warren, and uh, well, let, let me go let me backtrack. Uh, I want to say a happy father with all the fathers, and um, and I think the fathers, 
we so somebody follow the Lord every day. They are doing a good job with him. So yes, yes, absolutely. But, uh, yeah, yeah, and. and uh, you know, Elizabeth Warren, you know, and I, I noticed that she, she's gaining traction a lot because uh, she's sticking to her, she's, she's sticking to her, to her issues, and she, she's really, um, you know, giving you more information about wh- wh- how she's staying and uh, and and why. So, uh, and I think you know, you, you know, the battle is going to be where, where with Joe Biden or whatever, he's going to get distracted or whatever, and and that's what I'm really afraid of, be him getting distracted or get pulled, you know pulls away from his issues or whatever and from his platform and try to, you know, defend himself. So let me ask you though, but I, but how, I, how important is it that you hear the candidates call and you're a regular voter? How, how do you, how important is it that you hear the candidates put out their position on various issues? It, 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 it's, it's very important, you know, cause I, because I, I think when they say this, it, it means that they are hearing what, what what the people need or whatever. You know, you 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 are you're listening to your constituents, constituents, and that means a lot of whatever. But if you go off track it and you you start saying something else, well, I mean, we, we really know that once you get an office or whatever, you may be able to pass some of these, um, you know, fix some of these things or whatever. But you know, and you know, on the other hand, you may. Um, you know, you might be pulled away from them. So it's very important. It is very important. You know, you just want that that uh, candidate to to hear you. Is that and, why and you think? Something. Let me. Ask, is that why you think that uh, Elizabeth Warren is gaining traction because she's putting out as as relatively specific positions on various issues? Yes, yes, because she's giving you a lot of information what she wants to do it and how she wants to do it. Oh, or okay. Now, and then go ahead. go ahead, Carl. And I and I and I think. You know, um, you know, a lot of people they they do want to see a a, a, a female in office because you you had a black guy and you had you know you trying to break this you know the pattern of the old white guy. Okay, I, I'm I'm gonna leave that alone. I think that's a loaded question. I'm not gonna say what people whether they want a woman <laughs> or a man. But what I'm gonna do, Carl, is if you watch me on Facebook, I take notes, and my notes say that you are a Bernie guy. No, no, no. It says you're Biden. No, no. Biden. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hold on, hold on. Yeah, yeah, Biden. Biden, your guy. And, and Biden last week put out a paper about climate change. And then it turned out that he had cut and pasted that information from somebody else. He didn't give any credits. Mm. And my question to you is, did that bother you? He's done that before. He, yeah, he has a history of <laughs> not giving credit. Did it bother you that when Biden finally put out some information, that information was a little, I thought it was kind of, it seemed kind of weak. In comparison to what yeah. we're seeing from Elizabeth Warren with her detailed positions that seem more authentic, right? Because you know, by him being uh, uh, he's been in office a long time, and some of his uh, parts or whatever back back in those in the seventies and eighties or whatever, you know, he wasn't so firm on some of those issues or whatever. And it's coming it's coming back to Biden. Gotcha. All right, so man. Now, Listen to me, Carl. I want so you to hold on. Hold on, Carl. Hold that thought. I'm going to let you think because I know I hit you with a side swipe on that one. You hold that thought. We're going to take a quick break real quick, pay some bills. I wanna, When we come back, I'm going to let you finish explaining how you how, how Bernie is sac- sizing up with Elizabeth Warren with detailed stuff that he's putting out. You're on uh, In Touch News Radio, Reality Radio, where everybody's a star. We'll be right back. Mr. Bond, where's my, where's my time? Where's my time?
Belinda Archie with Tyre Temple United Methodist Church. Join us every first and third Saturday of the month at the Village Market East Tampa, 3206 North Sanchez Street. Free parking, free admission, fresh produce, live entertainment, vendor shopping, and delicious cooked food. Join us every first and third Saturday of the month beginning June 22nd. For vendor information, call me 1-888-991-2502. See our ad in In Touch News or Florida Sentinel. Please call me at 1-888-991-2502. The Village Market at East Tampa, 3206 North Sanchez Street. Hi, this is Dale Day. Join me every Monday at 7 p.m. for Jazz at Miss Connie's House. Bringing you the smoothest jazz and the coolest guests right here on In Touch Radio. Paris, good attorney to some of you out there. Um, I'm sitting in the studio, got, got Monica Williams Harris in co hosting with me. And I've been informed by a very, very live and an authoritative source that we did not list her her most important, her most important role for Gentry. And that is, she is the wife of Keith Harris. <laughs> Yes, I am. I, I, yes, I am. I am the wife of Keith Harris. Yes, man, Keith, we appreciate you sharing her with us this morning. Uh, uh, you know, and I, for some reason, I, I was sure I was gonna be able to get Keith in there first. But look, Monica, she done cut the line and got in studio. Thank you so much, Monica, for coming in and co-hosting with us. Uh, as we talked about earlier, Monica has written a a, a wonderful book about adoption, focused on uh, the African American child and parent experience called God's Promise, yes. and you're having a book book event today? Today at the Portico, okay. uh, 2 o'clock and 3.30. Now, where is the Portico? You just throw it out. Like everybody know. knows it's, the Portico. It's 1001, I think that's the address, North Florida Avenue. That is correct. It's downtown. It's, it's downtown. one block north of Kennedy. Correct. Right, and then for those of you who have really been in Tampa a lot while, it is the old federal courthouse. I did not, I did not know that. Yes. I did not know yes, that. Well, I, I will also tell you that um, I did not realize this, that the, the all the proceeds from the Portico, they have a cafe, so it's the Portico Cafe, all the proceeds from the Portico Cafe go to help various um, homeless initiatives. Really? Yeah, and it's affiliated with Hyde Park, okay. Methodist, Baptist, okay. whatever the church is over there. Yeah, day. yeah. And for y'all who've really been in Tampa a long time, it's where you used to catch the bus if you went downtown and you were getting the transfer to go to Ybor City to do some shopping. So that's where this the Portico is, the old federal courthouse, the old downtown bus station and our transfer location. So please come out, support Monica, support all of our young our professionals, our entrepreneurs that are doing things in this community, in touch news fits in that category. This kind of stuff, it really takes um, some bravery to expose yourself and do this because I, I believe the the African American family unit is a different kind of it unit. Is. It is. We've always had this unofficial adoption. Yeah. You know, our house, you know, at times felt like a rooming. We had so many cousins and we, that's people we coming and going. Yeah. 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 We talk about the village. Right. The village is, I mean, that is who we are as a people. Yeah. Right. And yeah. so I, I commend you for taking the the initiative to. Uh, to to go out and, and make this happen and coming in this morning talk a little politics. I was kind of getting with Carl. Carl, are you still there? Yes, I am. Yes, I so am. Carl, yes. So I, I was getting with Carl a little bit because I didn't think Biden has been meeting Warren with what he's putting out. And so while his numbers may not have changed, she's gobbling up and she's coming up. She's eating kind of like Donald Trump did. Yeah. She's eating her way to the top. Does it does is it a concern to you that Biden is not putting out more? specific information about his positions, Carl? Yeah, that's, that, yeah that is a big concern, but, you know, um, well, I, I'm really concerned about his position, uh, who he's going to debate. That's going to be the determining factor right there, who, who, who he debates. Okay, so he's on and, the stage with, what was it, Cory Booker? No, he's on the stage with Kamala Harris. Kamala Harris, um, Bernie Sanders. Kamala Harris, Harris, right. Those are the two, those are the two big ones. So so I mean, you're going to be looking Mayor at... Mayor Pete, maybe in that Pete, same Pete, thing, Pete Buttigieg. So you're going to be looking to hear what he does in the debate. 
If that's right. important to you. Okay. And it's still a little bit. Yeah, early. very important. Okay. So, all right, then, Carl. We appreciate you calling. I want to keep you on the line any longer than that. We thank you for listening in. Uh, and uh, as always, man, you be safe out there. All right. Take care, Carl. Okay. Let, let me give you this horn. Oh, 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 man. You start. Oh, so you're really in the truck, huh? <laughs> So we have this thing over Carl. Carl calls and he claims he's in a truck driving across America. I don't know. Could be. It could not be. Uh, but anyway, that's him blowing his horn. Is let y'all know he really is somewhere in a truck crossing America. Uh, but anyway, so 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 Monica, we have the 2020 election coming up. Right. My concern is, it, 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 is, 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 as I said, with Carl about these positions, um, uh, are. They gonna really matter as much, I think. Cause I, I think that's almost like people that get too far into the politics. Right. Right. You said people vote off the emotions they, early. They, they do. They tend. To, people tend to vote. Well, I can only speak to Democrat. I think somebody said this the last session too, that um, that people tend to the dip, the Republicans tend to fall in line, uh-huh. where we have to fall in love. Yeah. Hold on for a minute, okay. Martin. So Esteban, I got some music in my ears. That should be, that be coming through. That's you taking me to break. No, no, man. Hang up. Hang man, don't up. Don't you take me to break, man. <laughs> <laughs> no, don't you steal any more of my time, man. <laughs> that's okay. I'm, I, that's, that's okay. I'll still get rid of tell, ch- 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 that call down. Anyway, sorry about that, Monica. That's okay. So, but go ahead. Um, so, I think, I, think the last, I think the last episode, the last, um, I think you and Ed, uh, Representative Narain last week talked about, um, I think he mentioned, he said that Republicans fall in line, whereas Democrats have a tendency to want to fall in love. And so yes. we we have to connect okay. uh, with with whomever the candidate is. Um, and so I think the problem for Biden is that he's been in office, so he's been in public office for so long that he's taken some positions and, and written some bills and supported some bills that people are going to use against him like the crime bill like the crime bill right now admittedly and i've had you know i've had this conversation you know he wrote the crime bill but there are black folks in the community that were talking about the amount of crime that was happening in the community bill clinton signed it right, now I, so I, he, I, he, he may have authored it th- listen, bill okay. clinton signed it he said, and he and needed, black, look and, look I would look. I was coming of age in the eighties. He needed to sign that bill, correct? Because so, the nineties had gutted that that crack had ran correct. through the community. And so, and so I think that we have we have um, we have a short memory in terms of the fact that as a community, how bad it was when that crime bill was signed was 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 authored, yes, was passed, and eventually was signed by Bill Clinton. And I think we're willing to take up talking points sometimes. Correct. If, if you say it enough, you just you, correct. You you correct. say it enough times. People will take up talking points, right. but but crack ran through black communities, right? And so for rampantly. Me, so for me, and I like Joe Biden. Um, my issue with Joe Biden is his what I his stance with the Anita Hill um, situation okay. in that particular hearing and how he handled that. Okay. Um, I didn't. I did not like um, the way that it, as a man. He, some of the questions that he asked her, I thought were inappropriate. It's not something that you would ask a man ever. And so, again, take you have to everything's in context. Taking in context, kind of where we were, what's the time period we were in, what was kind of going on in the country. But people are focused on that t- on that crimes bill with Joe Biden. There were unintended consequences re- resulting from that, and I think he's acknowledged that. That's not and, an excuse and, and, for. And, and oftentimes, and oftentimes, you know, you may have good intentions. And then someone else utilizes Correct. something very differently Correct. than the way that it was. And it was utilized, I think, at the time to give law enforcement more yeah. authority to remove some of these people from the community Correct. so that the communities could heal. Right. So but the communities, you know. And, but there were unintended consequences because you have black families. You talk about black fathers being strong in um, and that's the, necessi- the need for black men to be in the community and strong black men to be in the community. That crimes bill had an un- a significant and serious unintended consequence by removing a lot of black men yes um for nonviolent drug and, and that and that is the thing I, I don't think we saw we were so Correct. quick to want to punish people that i think that got lost somehow in the mix all right so we've got about about five six minutes i'm gonna do a quick round of two topics i want to ask you about i okay. heard last week that andrew gillum uh is is indicated he's gonna be running for governor again i didn't know if he meant the next round yeah or somewhere in the future what are your thoughts about that I mean, if he runs again, I'm there. I mean, I was I was hard. I was an Andrew Gillum hard fan the uh-huh. first go round, and I, you know, I was with him in the primary season. Okay, so I wasn't one of these yes. Johnny Come Lately folks. Got um, it. 
there's something special about Andrew, and you know that there's something special about an Andrew Gillum when you have people who are focused on attempting to pick whatever piece they can. Uh-huh. That whole uh, Hamilton ticket foolishness was ridiculous. You have people that are sitting in office currently in Tallahassee Mm -hmm. that are doing things people don't really know about. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, That's Monica, y'all. That wasn't Clint. I didn't say any names, (laughs) but I I, 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 I am... There are people that are probably in Tallahassee. I'll probably <laughs> probably in Tallahassee yes, yes. right now that are that are engaged in in shenanigans or were engaged in shenanigans, and, and no one's brought it to the forefront. The right. reason that they brought it to the forefront, and I'm just gonna be real, yes. is you have a young African American man who is going to be a superstar, who's saying, who has the ability to get on the ground, galvanize people who have been, who feel they've been ignored for a long time to get right. them to the polls. Right. The fact that he only lost by 37,000 votes and he wow. was able to get so many people who had never voted. All we needed was, never we voted. needed Pookie, we never needed Ray you, Ray, you, you Shaniqua, Ray Chanel. We needed all, we needed everybody that could, and I'm hoping that that the lesson has been learned locally in the state of Florida about elections. George, I hope they learned their lesson. Yeah. That, listen, we got to get people to show up nationally. What happened right. with Hillary? If people don't show up, there are severe consequences and then long term consequences. Long term consequences. So, for, as an example, Andrew not being getting elected as governor. The the I my focus for the gubernatorial race, in addition to all the other things was the Supreme Florida Supreme Court. Yes. That was my focus. Judges, diverse judges on the bench. People people talk about the fact that they don't believe the justice system is blind. Hell, it's not, you know, for, for, right. for all intents and purposes, because right. you have people you have people on the bench right now that when a young black man comes in uh, for something, for been charged with something, what they see is a threat. Correct. And that's real. They're not going to say that. Get him off the street, put They're, him right. away. They're not going to say that. They can't fight back. They're not the going to say that, but implicit bias is real. And so my the other focus on the national level is people aren't thinking about these lifetime, lifetime judicial appointments that Mitch McConnell is running through that are going to have judges. negative implications long term. Yes. So you talk about Brown versus Board of Education. They're not going to overturn Brown versus Board of Education, but they're going to have some cases that come up that kind of make it less... less redefine like, unitary redefine, status and right. some of that kind, kind of, of stuff. Kind of redefine yes. that thing. Uh-huh. You, yeah. Roe versus Wade is, in, right. is, is, fo- is a focus right now. They are putting people that are on the bench right now at the federal level that will have the ability to look at cases that can overturn Roe v. Wade. So is, is it about health care? Yes. Is it about education? Yes. Is it about criminal justice? Um, yes. But if you don't have the right people on the bench and people don't, I don't think yes. lawyers, black lawyers in particular, do a good enough job educating the community about what the implications are if you get the wrong people in Congress on the national level, in the legislature, on the state level, about how those judicial appointments um, can impact your everyday life because wow. they do. Listen, I, well, I thank you for jumping to my last topic because I wanted to say what were going to be important issues in the 2020 election. Yeah. You've kind of touched on that a little bit, and uh, hopefully you've given some encouragement and inspiration to people as they think about what their position is going to be on various issues. As always, everybody, I really do wake up in the morning on Saturday with the goal of keeping it straight up the middle, and I think we achieved that goal of going right down the left side this morning. So thank you for listening. I appreciate you. Monica, as always, appreciate you for coming it in. It's a pleasure. I will that, come uh, back. This absolutely. So we're going to get you we're gonna get you back. Esteban, welcome to the team, man. Hey, y'all, we'll see you next week. Or listen to me next week. Intech News Radio, Reality Radio, where everybody is a star.